The sun has 20 pointy bits, and you're not greedy, you only want one of them. So one way that you could do that is take a fifth, and then take a half of what's remaining, and then take a half of that, and hey presto, you've got one twentieth of the sun. Is it important what order you do that in? Well, let's check. We could do a half of the sun first, and then we could take a fifth of what's left, and then we could take a half of that, and it works again. We've got one twentieth. Let's try the one last way. We could take a half of the sun, then a half again, and then a fifth of what's left. And again it works. Is that just coincidence? Hmm. Of course it's not. That is an example of the commutative property of multiplication. It might not be immediately obvious which fractions we can use on the sun so we end up with an integer number of those pointy bits. We've seen that we can use one half and one fifth, but we could also have used one quarter or one tenth. We could not have used one eighth because 20 times one eighth is equal to two and a half. That's an ugly non-integer, yuck. So we don't want to do that. Uh, you can see that we've ended up with two and a half of those pointy bits. That's no good. Which fractions can we use on a number and still end up with an integer? So to tackle this, what we want to do first of all is we want to talk about some properties of fractions. A proper fraction is one where the numerator is strictly less than the denominator. So here we have the numerator more than the denominator, so this is not a proper fraction. Is this a proper fraction? No, here the two are equal. Is this a proper fraction? Yes, here the numerator is less than the denominator, so that is good. Is this a proper fraction? Of course it is. And this is a special proper fraction. This is a unit fraction because the numerator is 1. And we're going to make our life even easier by just considering unit fractions for the next little while. I want to know all of the unit fractions that I could multiply 240 by and end up with an integer. So that's really the same thing as just asking what are all of the divisors of 240? Well, we can use the fundamental theorem of our arithmetic and we can uh, um, start to find out all of those prime factors using a prime factorization tree. So 240 is 24 times 10 and we can split off 24 by 3 times 8 and 10 is 2 times 5 and 8 is 4 times 2 and 4 is 2 times 2. So there are all of the prime factors of 240. And it doesn't matter what prime factorization tree I use for 240, it's always going to turn out to be the same. So I could choose 2 times 120, and then 2 times 60, and then 2 times 30, and 2 times 15, and 3 times 5. And I still get those same set of three, uh, a 3, a 5, and 4 twos. So it doesn't matter how I split it up, I'm always going to get the same result a 3, a 5, and 4 twos. So how can I use that to create all of the possible unit fractions that I can multiply by 240 and get an integer? Well, I can choose any subset of those numbers. So I can take all the twos, and 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 16. So 1 16th um, I can use, and I will get a, an integer if I multiply that by 240. I could also take 3 times 5 to give me 1 15th. I can also take 2 times 2 times 3 and get 1 24th. And I can keep on doing. I can choose systematically, hopefully I can find a more systematic way of doing this, and I can get the whole spectrum of uh, numbers that I can multiply by 240, all of those unit fractions that result in an integer. So there's an achievement. 240 has lots of factors, and therefore there's lots of unit fractions that you can multiply it by and still end up with an integer. 
But if you're given an average integer and an average unit fraction, how can you be sure that whenever you multiply them together, they're going to end up at another integer? Well, there's some little mathematical tricks that you can use. Some of these you're going to be familiar with. Others are going to be entirely new. So, for example, to determine if something is divisible by 10, all that you need to do is to look at the last digit. Is this number divisible by 10? Of course not, because there's a 7 at the last digit. Is this number divisible by 10? Yes. The only thing that matters is the last digit, because in the tens, hundreds, thousands, or millions position, it doesn't matter which digit you have, it's only the ones digit that's going to determine that. What about divisibility by 4? Well, that's a little bit less obvious, but thankfully you can look at a number and again, it's only the last two digits this time that make a difference. So is this number divisible by 4? Yes, because 36 is divisible by 4. You could figure out these mathematical tricks by yourself. For example, for 1 ninth, we could ask for 1 million. Is 1 million multiplied by 1 ninth, is that going to work? Well, no, because 999,999 is going to be divisible by 9, and 1 million is just one more than that. So that means that if you divide 1 million by 9, you're going to end up with the remainder of 1. What about dividing 2 million by 9? Well, of course, that's going to be double, so you're going to end up with a remainder of 2. What about 100,000? Well, that's going to be 1 more than 99,999, so again, that's going to have a remainder of 1. What about 1,100,000? Well, the 1 million part is going to have a remainder of 1, and the 100,000 part is going to have a remainder of 1, so that is going to have a remainder of 2. So again, it's not going to work. What about 5,580,000? Well, 5 million is going to donate a remainder of 5, and the 500,000 is going to donate another remainder of 5, and the 80,000 is going to donate another remainder of 8. So 5 plus 5 plus 8, that's going to be equal to 18. So it looks like that's not going to work either because remainder 18, oh wait a second, but 18 is divisible by 9. So that is going to work. So you see, all that we need to do to figure out if something is divisible by 9 is we need to add up all of the digits and see if that number is divisible by 9. Some divisibility tests are tough enough that you wouldn't want to do it whenever you're being chased by nasty... This is the divisibility test for 13. How does it work? Well, let's say that you're trying to figure out the number 943,020,000. Is that divisible by 13? Well. We have a divisibility test. It has six numbers. They're right, read right to left, starting with 1. The 1 is going to go above the 1's position. The minus 3 is going to go above the 10's position, minus 4 above the 100's position, and so on. There we go. Now we notice that we haven't reached the 943 million, so we have to repeat the divisibility test, starting from 1, then going minus 3 again. So there we go. So that is the first step. Now we multiply vertically. So minus 4 times 9 is 36. Minus 3 times 4, minus 12. 1 times 3 is 3. 3 times 2 is 6. We add up those results. So minus 36 minus 12, that's going to be minus 48. Plus 9, that's going to be minus 39. Is minus 39 divisible by 13? Yes, it is. So that means that 943,020,000 is divisible by 13. Obviously a fact that you should memorize.